Yep, I'm going to start. So uh, welcome to Neurology uh, Grand Rounds today. This is today's CME. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, we'll put New Year. Today is the birthday of as well as World Braille Day. It's also National Blood Donor Month and Winter Sports Traumatic Brain Injury Awareness Month. Will's idea of a traumatic brain injury sport was mountain climbing. Mine was uh, slightly different. The fleeces are in for everyone, so a little bit of good news. They're right outside of Gina's office. Remember, you all ordered one color of the two. They're all unisex and multiple sizes, so just uh, you can go get your fleece. Uh, we'll put this in April 1993, the New York Times, Gina Collada wrote on uh, how uh, MRI was becoming a, uh, a new and incredibly valuable technique in uh, neuroscience and stroke. Just as a bit of background, two people won the Nobel Prize in 2003 for uh, the discovery of MRI, Paul uh, Laubauer and Peter Mansfield. This is actually the first MRI, the abdomen of a college student of the University of Chicago, Chicago Urbana. And you can see how uh, some things have changed and some things haven't, but you know, just how the technology around MRI is now so good, they don't have to put outlines around them. But I think the beer can is still the same on college campuses. Our all-star Gwendolyn Redcliffe Adams, one of the polysomnography techs, an anonymous patient uh, uh, nominated her for her incredible service in helping the patient get the right uh, piece of equipment. Uh, on the research roundup, Andy Liu, Thomas Farr, and Simon Davis wrote a piece about cognitive effects of, of COVID. Tatiana Segura again wrote a piece on the effect of uh, matrix uh, proteins and stroke regeneration in mice. Lisa Hobson Webb was part of the team that looked at yeah, a new no. way. Yeah, no, can, every, can everyone yeah, no. can everyone mute, yeah, no. please? Yeah, no. can, yeah. Am I singing it? Can everyone mute, please? Thank you. Uh, Lisa Hobson Webb was a part of a team that was uh, described the new MRI technology called shear wave elastic imaging. And Gabrielle Torabala Acosta, who's a neurocritical care fellow, came up with a review checklist for ICU safety. Uh, again, this is our uh, CME. And now uh, Shivani Shah is going to do today's case presentation. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. Reader, the big screen. I just speak into the two months. That's good. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shivani. I'm one of the child neurology PGY3s. This case presentation is involving a patient who was on the general neurology service a few months ago. All right. So in December of 2021, this patient presented in the outpatient neurology setting. We have a 50 year old female with lupus, CVA. Um, PFO status was closure and migraines, presenting with generalized muscle weakness, intermittent episodes of diplopia, hoarseness, dysphagia, and a 50-pound weight loss throughout a three-month period. At that time, her neuro exam was notable for her being quite cachectic. Uh, she had a hoarse voice. Her cranial nerve exam was normal. She had generalized muscle weakness. However, she mentions that she's able to climb stairs and shower on her own at this time. She had no sensory deficits. Uh, she had reduced muscle bulk and reflexes were two plus throughout and no muscle fasciculations were observed. Subsequently, uh, subsequently the patient was uh, hospitalized for failure to thrive and then she was uh, uh, got a peg tube placed. Uh, outpatient workup continued over the next few months. Uh, and so basically this is uh, the workup as follows. Acetylcholine receptor antibodies were negative Musk was not tested for myasthenia gravis. CK was mildly elevated. MRI brain was reportedly normal. CT abdomen pelvis was without signs of malignancy. EMG in March of 2022 showed, diffuse, showed a diffuse myopathic process involving proximal and distal muscles. However, there was no evidence of a neuromuscular junction disorder. 
At this point, there was consideration of bulbar onset ALS. However, uh, there was still no upper motor neuron findings. Fast forward to July of 2022, patient presents to Duke uh, for symptomatic bradycardia. She was found to have a complete heart block and a pacemaker was placed. Neurology was also consulted during the session. On exam, we found a frail female who was dysarthric. She had a hoarse voice. She appeared much older than her stated age. Cranial nerves were intact. She had diffuse muscle weakness, three out of fives throughout global muscular atrophy and no muscle fasciculations. And she was normal to hyporeflexic. At Duke, the workup uh, was quite extensive. Uh, the notable parts are here. MRI brain was without evidence of a brainstem lesion. Perineoplastic panel was negative. My myasthenia gravis panel was repeated, including musk, which was negative, and anti-SRP was negative. We got a repeat EMG also, and this showed widespread myopathic motor units accompanied by fibrillations and sharp waves. Afterwards, we got a muscle biopsy, which had findings that were pathognomonic for a vacuolar myopathy. Uh, there was concern for hydro hydroxychloroquine myotoxicity and also possibly Pompe disease. Patient received high dose IV steroids for three days after this. Hydroxychloroquine was discontinued, of course. Genetics consult was not significant. Pompe workup was non diagnostic, and the genetic neuromuscular panel uh, showed results of unknown significance. A month later, after discontinuation of hydroxychloroquine, patient had actually made remarkable improvement. She was able to walk without a walker, shower, and wash her hair. This is quite remarkable. It's also interesting because hydroxychloroquine has a pretty long half-life. So um, it was usually we would have expected upon discharge a little bit um, of a slower recovery, but it's great news. As you all know, vacuolar myopathies can be associated with lysosomal dysfunction of genetic etiology, but the main takeaway point here is that there are common medications such as chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and amiodarone that can also cause a vacuolar myopathy. So it's important to keep that in mind when we see patients with autoimmune diseases such as lupus um, and even heart conditions as well. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful. All right, uh, Brian, would you like to introduce today's grand round speaker? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks very much, Rich. So um, it's a real privilege this morning to be able to introduce Dr. Giorgio Sivuli for uh, Grand Rounds. Dr. Sivuli is a professor of neurology and chairman of the Department of Neurology at the National University of Athens uh, in Athens, Greece. Um, it's very hard to, you know, do a, a brief introduction uh, for Dr. Sivuli and try and synopsize career, his career. But, you know, you know, you could one could say that you know, his career is characterized by a global reputation for you know, his track record of creative and intellectual and operational leadership within large scale kind of clinical and translational studies uh, within neurology, especially stroke neurology. Um, his studies really cross the many different domains, including acute stroke treatment, acute stroke secondary prevention. And he's really got practice changing publications in all the domains of stroke care that have culminated, according to a PubMed search, in, in essentially 700 peer reviewed publications. Um, his domains of study include neurovascular ultrasonography, um, intravenous thrombolysis and other reperfusion therapies in acute ischemic stroke. And I think one of the most interesting things about Dr. Suguli's uh, career and output um, is his focus on systematic review and other forms of evidence uh, synthesis. Um, and his group have, have really published an, an enormous amount of extremely high quality uh, uh, you know, work within the field of evidence uh, synthesis. Um, he serves a number of leadership uh, positions, including acting as a committee member of multiple steering committees for international randomized control trials, multiple DSMBs. He's currently the vice president of the European Stroke Organization and the president of the Hellenic Neurological uh, Society. And in addition to all of this, he directs stroke research at the University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center. Um, so it's a real privilege to have him this morning and have him take time out of his busy schedule to join us. And his talk is entitled Intravenous Thrombolysis for Acute Ischemic Stroke, Recent Advances and Last Frontiers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, for this kind introduction. It's a privilege to be able to present in, um, in your group. And uh, as uh, my title alludes to, I would like you to remind you that over the past 60 years, there have been uh, four different movies with the theme Last Frontier that were uh, filmed either in Canada, in uh, Europe, 
or in Africa. So the, similarly, over the past 40 years, what we were considered the last frontiers of, for intravenous thrombolysis have been greatly expanding. And uh, I'm sure that I will be able to convince you that uh, we haven't seen yet the last frontiers of intravenous thrombolysis. So uh, these are my intellectual and financial disclosure slide. I'm going to discuss the expansion of current indications and revision of relative contraindications, novel thrombolytic agents, the extension of the time window without use of advanced neuroimaging, and the use of thrombolysis before and after endovascular thrombectomy. Now, uh, what are the new frontiers with regard to the expansions of the current indications? Uh, I will summarize uh, only four uh, to save some time because this is a lecture that would last up to like three or four hours. So uh, for me, uh, major new frontiers represent non-disabling minor stroke with large vessel occlusion, pretreatment with novel oral anticoagulants, history of previous ischemic stroke within the past three months, and history of previous intracerebral hemorrhage. For all these four indications, there are no randomized data. And uh, we know from the PRISM clinical trial that uh, intravenous thrombolysis uh, uh, is associated with increased bleeding rate in patients with minor ischemic stroke with non-disabling uh, symptoms. And you can see here the five uh, symptomatic intracranial bleeds compared to zero bleeds in the control arm. Uh, so what is the minor non-disabling stroke? What is the operational de definition? This is a patient who can bathe, bathe dress, ambulate, take care of his hygiene and teeth. And uh, uh, we know that these are cases with isolated facial droop, mild hemisensory loss, uh, mild uh, motor loss, and uh, these are patients that can still ambulate. According to this trial, uh, the recent uh, American Heart Association recommendations uh, highlight that uh, intravenous thrombolysis is, not, uh, is of no benefit in patients with mild NIH score 0 to 5 uh, non-disabling stroke. Similarly, uh, the European Stroke Organization guidelines that I had the privilege to be a co-author of this uh, group I have a moderate quality of evidence with a strong recommendation to give intravenous thrombolysis in patients with minor disabling ischemic stroke, but uh, a, a weak recommendation against giving intravenous thrombolysis in patients with minor non-disabling non -disabling ischemic stroke. Uh, what about the patients with large vessel occlusion and minor non-disabling stroke? So six out of eight members have voted, one of the six was myself, in favor of giving intravenous alteplase to these patients. And this is, of course, based on expert opinion. And uh, there is very scarce data. Uh, this is a paper we published a couple of years ago, International Multicenter Cohort, where we showed that uh, intravenous thrombolysis in patients with minor, both disabling and non-disabling stroke was associated with excellent functional outcome uh, defined as MRA 0 to 1 and functional dependence defined as MRA 0 to 2. Actually, in this specific subgroup of patients with minor stroke, intravenous thrombolysis was independently associated with favorable outcome in contrast to mechanical thrombectomy that was not. And uh, this is the largest today study on this topic. And it shows again the favorable effect of intravenous thrombolysis in patients with minor stroke. Uh, among these patients, 25% of this cohort had minor non-disabling stroke and large vessel occlusion. And in this subgroup, again, intravenous thrombolysis was shown to be effective. Now, me moving now to another topic, which is, which is pretreatment with novel oral anticoagulants either factor 10, 10A inhibitors or thrombin inhibitors. Uh, this is the first meta-analysis that was published in the field. It concluded data from uh, cohort studies and case reports. A total of 492 patients pretreated with NOAX within 40 hours from symptom onset. Uh, these patients were treated with intravenous thrombolysis. And again, you can see that the symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage rate was low, only 4%. We have conducted a similar meta-analysis with Ramin Zand and his group, and uh, we only included cohorts. We have removed case reports. Again, we have documented a low rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage in patients 
pretreated with a novel oral anticoagulation and receiving intravenous thrombolysis within 48 hours from the last NOAC intake. Uh, another important issue is the safety of intravenous thrombolysis in patients pretreated with the Bigatran who receive uh, the Bigatran reversal with darucizumab. So this is the meta-analysis by Italian colleagues published in JNNP. Uh, they report uh, again a low rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, 5.5%. And uh, there was a contralateral MCA occlusion complicating the reversal in one case. However, 82% of the 55 cases experienced a substantial neurological improvement and the median neurological improvement at 24 hours was five points in the NNIH stroke scale score. Uh, similarly, in our uh, meta-analysis, we have uh, documented that baseline NIH stroke scale score was 10, and this improved to two points. So the median reduction was eight points in patients who were pretreated with the Bigatran and who received a reversal with uh, Idarucizumab, and then they had treatment with intravenous thrombolysis with Alteplase. Uh, these are the results of a national cohort from New Zealand where they have uh, treated a, a large number of patients uh, with idarucizumab following intravenous thrombolysis. All these patients had received uh, the bigatran within 24 hours uh, prior to symptom onset. And again, we can see that uh, the investigators report a very good safety and efficacy outcomes. This is a paper that just came out in JAMA Neurology a couple of days ago. I think this is the largest cohort study today. It includes 832 patients uh, pretreated with NOACs who received intravenous thrombolysis following either reversal in the case of the Bigatran or without any reversal in the case of uh, pixaban, rivaroxaban, or endoxaban. And you can see that the symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage rate was low, only 3%. What was very interesting is in, in this study was the negative association between recent dog ingestion and the odds of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, which provides further support for the use of intravenous thrombolysis in patients pretreated with NOx in selected cases. I would like to highlight that in patients treated with a factor 10A inhibitors, uh, the reversal with andexanet alpha is not recommended because, first of all, you need a two hour infusion to reverse uh, the anti factor 10A inhibitors. So, uh, most likely, you're going to be outside the window of thrombolysis for treating the patient. And also, um, there are uh, major course concerns re regarding rebound hypercoagulability and the high cost of andexanet alpha. So in these patients, if there is evidence of large vessel occlusion, direct mechanical thrombectomy is recommended. There is a single case report published in stroke in a patient in Germany who has uh, been pretreated with a pixaban, 5 milligram BID. He has received a bolus dose of andexanet alpha and immediately uh, treated with intravenous thrombolysis with TPA without the infusion of uh, two hours of andexanet alpha. He received the TPA following the andexanet alpha bolus dose. And there was evidence of rebound effect uh, hypercoagulability, and there were also thrombotic complications in this case. So what do the international, uh, what do the European Stroke Organization recommendations say about uh, this specific stroke subgroup? First of all, uh, there is a a strong recommendation that uh, we should not deliver intravenous thrombolysis in unselected patients pretreated with NOAX within 48 hours from uh, last dose ingestion. However, there is expert opinion that uh, we can deliver intravenous thrombolysis in selected patients with anti 10 activity less than 0.5 units per ml or with thrombin time less than 60. And again, in patients who are uh, pretreated with the Bigatran, we can safely deliver intravenous thrombolysis following a reversal of the Bigatran using darucizumab. However, in patients pretreated with factor 10A inhibitors, a nine out of nine group members recommend against the combination of andexan and alpha and intravenous thrombolysis. Uh, this recommendation is uh, slightly expanded in uh, three expert opinion papers that are summarized in this slides and uh, all of these uh, papers highlight the importance of individualized 
approach and considering intravenous thrombolysis either in patients pretreated with the bigadran if thrombin time is less than 60 or the bigadran plasma level less than 50 in patients pretreated with darosizumab for the bigger travel, the bigger travel reversal. In patients pretreated with factor 10A inhibitors, if the factor 10A plasma level is less than 20, and in patients pretreated with factor 10A inhibitors, if anti 10A activity is less than 0.5 unit per ml. Uh, another important uh, subgroup are the patients who had a recent ischemic stroke within the past three months, and then they suffer a recurrent stroke. Uh, the best uh, available evidence with regard to the treatment of this stroke comes from the Get With The Guidelines registry. This is the largest today data set that has been published. And uh, if you see the, the first analysis, then there is a clear evidence that intravenous thrombolysis is associated with higher odds of functional dependence and mortality in this specific subgroup. However, if you dive in the evidence and uh, you can digest the data, you can see that uh, these uh, adverse events are related to the symptom elapsed time between the uh, first stroke and the second stroke. So if thrombolysis, intravenous thrombolysis is delivered within 14 days uh, uh, after the index stroke event, then the rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage is very high, 16%. And uh, the rate of uh, TPA-related complications is 19%. And of course, if you break down uh, the odds of in-hospital mortalities in different time epochs, you can see that uh, there is a, a almost a triple increase in the rate of mortality in those patients who have uh, suffered a prior ischemic stroke within the last 14 days and are treated with intravenous thrombolysis. So I think uh, this is a very important consideration and um, we should not exclude all patients with a recent ischemic stroke within the past three months. So in the European Stroke Organization guidelines, uh, we believe that uh, uh, intravenous thrombolysis can be given in selected cases in patients with a small infarct and in patients with stroke occurring more than one month earlier or in patients who have a good clinical uh, recovery. So we need to be to individualize our decisions. However, if there is a recent ischemic stroke within the past 14 days, my clinical practice is not to uh, deliver intravenous thrombolysis in these patients and treat them in case of large vessel occlusion directly with mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, then there is another subgroup of patients, patients who had a history of prior intracranial hemorrhage. We all know that this was an absolute contraindication for all the uh, relevant uh, RCTs of intravenous thrombolysis for acute ischemic stroke. Uh, there are, uh, to the best of my knowledge, four only publications with a very limited number of patients. And you can see that in patients who have a history of prior intracerebral hemorrhage and then they suffer from acute ischemic stroke, intravenous thrombolysis may be safe. This is a case that we have treated with Andrei Alexandrov. He had a history of a right basal ganglia bleed, and then he uh, uh, came to a University of Tennessee with a left MCA occlusion and the intravenous thrombolysis was safe. Now, uh, based again on expert consensus, we can consider giving intravenous thrombolysis if there is a long time elapsed since the last hemorrhage and if there is a treatable cause of the intracerebral hemorrhage, for instance, subarachnoid hemorrhage with a, a subsequent clipping or coiling. Uh, or uh, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage due to antithrombotic medication that has been discontinued. Now, I'm going to move to another important topic, which is novel thrombolytic agents. And in this slide, uh, I have summarized the first generation, second and third generation of tissue plasminogenic inhibitors. And as you know, first generation was streptokinase, second generation alteplase and prorokinase, and the third generation or this most of the place staphylokinase and tenecteplase and I'm just referring uh, to uh, uh, thrombolytic medications with it, having at least a phase three clinical trial positive or negative. I would like to remind you that uh, TPA uh, is also bound by plasminogen activator inhibitor that results in inactivation of its capacity and activity 
uh, and uh, this reduces substantially the efficacy of alteplase. And uh, we know that the holy grail for systemic reperfusion for acute ischemic stroke is that the development of a novel thrombolytic agent that is more effective and safer than alteplase. Now, TIDK appears the, by far the most uh, promising uh, a thrombolytic agent. This is a third generation fibrinolytic. It has been approved for acute MI and is a genetically modified variant of alteplase. It has uh, modifications at three sites of the protein sac structure and uh, three amino acids were replaced at three positions that are called T and K. This is how it has uh, received the name of the nectoplase. And uh, it has some pharmacological properties indicating superiority compared to alteplase. First of all, uh, it has a fourfold higher fibrin specificity that can translate in an improved safety profile in terms of systemic bleeding. It has no neurotoxicity and no effect on blood brain barrier. We know that alteplase uh, impairs uh, blood brain barrier ability. And it has a, a tenecteplase has a more a, an improved safety profile in terms of intracranial bleeding compared to alteplase. At least this is the evidence in animal models. We will see later about uh, evidence in humans. Uh, it has an 80 fold higher resistance to plasminogen activator inhibitor, and this may translate into an improved efficacy profile. And it has a longer half life that translates into, into a more practical case use. For instance, it can be delivered as a single bonus injection. There is no need for bonus infusion. There is no need for intravenous infusion pump. And of course, there is no need for intravenous catheter. And of course, the half-life is much longer in tenecteplase compared to alteplase. Uh, this slide uh, will summarize the available clinical trials, either in phase two or phase three, comparing tenecteplase with alteplase in acute ischemic stroke patients, either unselected or in patients with large vessel occlusion. There is a total of nine trials and the evidence around these trials are summarized in the upcoming European Stroke Organization expedited recommendation on tenecteplase for acute ischemic stroke. This will appear within the next 10 days in the European Stroke Journal. So first of all, the quality of uh, these trials is high based on the risk of bias assessment. And um, there are seven trials comparing alteplase to tenecteplase 0.25 and three trials comparing alteplase to tenecteplase 0.40. Uh, this was a non-inferiority meta-analysis that we have conducted. The threshold for non-inferiority was 3%. And as you can see, the lower confidence interval is 0.3. It does not cross the non-inferiority threshold for excellent fu functional outcome defined as MRA 0 to 1. And this proves that uh, tenecteplase is non-inferior to alteplase for unselected acute ischemic stroke patients and for the tenecteplase dose of 0.25. However, if you see carefully this forest plot, you can see that there is an absolute benefit increase of 4% with tenecteplase compared to alteplase. The difference misses by little statistical significance, the p-value 0.04. If you transform that into an odds ratio, there is a 17% higher odds of excellent functional outcome with tenecteplase compared to alteplase. Of course, this is non uh, significant. However, the association between tenecteplase and major neurological improvement within the first 24 hours is significant. And of course, there is another trend of significant if you perform uh, ordinal logistic regression for MRS shift analysis. With regard to symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, there is no difference between uh, tenecteplase and alteplase. However, uh, tenecteplase is associated with 38% significant reduction in the odds of any intracranial hemorrhage, including both symptomatic and asymptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. And this is a figure that's going to appear in an invited uh, review for the uh, novel indications of intravenous thrombolysis in Lancet neurology. And you can see that the rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage with a dose of 0.25 is only 1.6%. However, if we use the dose of 0 
this increases exponentially to 5%. So the preferred dose with regard to safety is uh, 0.25. Now, in the subgroup of patients with LVO, there is an absolute significant benefit increase in terms of good clinical outcome at three months, MR02, of 16% with an ectoplase compared to alteplase. If we transform this absolute benefit increase into odds ratio, there is a 90% increase in the odds of a good functional outcome with an ectoplase compared to alteplase. And there is a significant association with regard to excellent functional outcome defined as MR0 to 1 and functional improvement defined as a shift in the MRS point as, as one point decrease across all MRS scores. Uh, now, um, what about the real world evidence uh, with regard to the use of the nectoplis and alteplis? This is the largest to date uh, uh, registry comparing the use of the nectoplis and alteplis in similar centers. This is data from the SITS ISTR uh, registry. And we included only centers that were treating patients both with the nectoplase or alteplase. And then we used propensity score matching methodology to adjust for potential confounders. And the, there was a one to three ratio with regard to the patients treated with the nectoplase who had a ratio of one and uh, the patients treated with alteplase had a ratio of three. And as you can see, uh, there is a, a significant improvement in terms of fun functional outcome in patients treated with the nectoplis compared uh, with uh, alteplis in the propensity score matched population. And of course, as you can see, there is no increase in the risk of uh, intracranial bleeding, but there is a substantial increase in the rates of excellent functional outcome and good functional outcome and a significant reduction in mortality in unmatched and unmatched patients treated with the nectoplis compared to alteplis. Also, there is uh, important data showing the efficacy of tenectoplase compared to alteplase in patients with uh, basilar artery occlusion, and uh, tenectoplase increases the rate of substantial reperfusion by fourfold compared to alteplase. There is uh, substantial information coming from New Zealand showing that the routine use of tenectoplase in a regional stroke network is associated with swifter delivery of thrombolytic, uh, shorter door to middle times, and no increase in uh, bleeding. So uh, they, uh, the investigators report both evidence of benefit and no evidence of harm when comparing tenectoplis to alteplis. And uh, uh, this is uh, also an important paper coming from New Zealand showing the safety of the nectoplis following uh, the bigatran reversal with idarucizumab in acute ischemic stroke patients who were pretreated pre -treated with the bigatran. And uh, uh, a couple of months ago, this important paper came from Stephen Wara group. Uh, where they provide very strong evidence that switching from alteplase to tenecteplase is associated with shorter door to needle time, shorter door in, door out times, and non inferior uh, clinical outcomes with regard to excellent uh, functional outcome and discharge. And of course, this was associated with reduced hospital costs. Uh, this is a meta-analysis that we have conducted, evaluating the off-label use of the nectoplase compared to alteplase for treating acute ischemic stroke patients in real-world evidence settings. Uh, we have summarized data from six real-world evidence studies, and you can see both in the unadjusted and adjusted association, there is a clear, strong relationship between the nectoplase use and better functional outcomes and high roads of successful recanalization in uh, patients with a large vessel occlusion. And in the real world uh, evidence settings, we see an absolute benefit increase of 5%. This was, as I showed you earlier, also reproduced in the randomized controlled clinical trial settings with the nectoplase compared to alteplase. And if we adjust for potential confounders, uh, this association becomes significant. 
So what are the advantages of connected plays compared to alt plays? It is, has a more practical case use. There are no safety con concerns. It is uh, non-inferior in compared to alt plays in unselected acute ischemic stroke patients. This was shown in ACT and in the meta-analysis of RCT that I have just said with you. It is potentially superior to alt plays in patients with large vessel occlusion when you bridge intravenous thrombolysis with mechanical thrombectomy. This is shown in RCTs and real-world evidence settings. It is cost-effective because it is associated with higher successful reperfusion rates, averting uh, more thrombectomies. It is feasible of implement to, uh, the implementation is feasible in everyday clinical practice settings. This was shown in Texas by Stephen Warrach Group and in New Zealand by Teddy Wu Group. And uh, international recommendations appear to favor connected plays over alt plays. However, there are some caveats in the widespread use of connected plays compared to alt plays. We need to keep in mind that we have uh, for the 0.4 dose one phase three RCT, which is neutral, and uh, one phase three RCT, RCT, which was negative. There was evidence of harm uh, with uh, TNK at a dose of 0 0.4 compared uh, to alt plays at a dose of 0 0.9. And uh, only one RCT, which was conducted by uh, Haley at uh, 2010, was double blind. All the other trials used a probe design. And uh, we need to keep in mind that we have much less information with regard to the use of TNK in off-label indications compared to TPA. There is no regulatory approval, and this may be associated with uh, medical legal concerns. Uh, there are potential doses errors, errors because uh, in Europe and in North America, the NECTE place is approved for acute MI, and the package instructions or relevant to a dose of 0.5 milligram per kilogram of the nectoplase. So we should ignore this dose instructions and we should give the nectoplase at a dose of 0.25 milligram per kilogram when we're treating acute ischemic stroke patients off label. Uh, we currently uh, know that there is a limited supply of TNK due to shortages in production, but I believe that the good news is the decision of Beringer Ingelheim based on the recent ISO guidelines to apply to European Medicines Agency to get a new license for acute ischemic stroke at a dose of 0.25 milligram per kilogram. And after having uh, discussed this with uh, Beringer officials, they believe that by the end of 2024, there will be a new indication for the nectoplase for acute ischemic stroke. Uh, these are ongoing trials that um, we provide additional evidence regarding the potential superiority of the nectoplase over alteplase in different uh, stroke subgroups. And these are uh, the uh, new ISO expedited recommendations stating that in patients with unselected ischemic stroke within four point half hours from symptom onset, who are eligible for intravenous thrombolysis, the nectoplase at a dose of 0.25 can be used as a safe and effective alternative to alteplase. We recommend against using the nectoplase at a dose of 0.4 milligram per kilogram based on the uh, Norwegian studies. In patients uh, with, uh, who are treated in mo mobile stroke units during pre-hospital management, uh, there is weak evidence in favor of the nectoplase 0.2 compared to alteplase based on the results of phase A trial. In patients with large vessel occlusion, there is a moderate quality of evidence and a strong recommendation to prefer the nectoplase over alteplase. And uh, in, the, in patients with uh, stroke on awakening or in the extended time window, um, uh, based on the negative results of twist trial, the nectoplase is not recommended. Uh, another agent that is currently in, being investigated uh, in Russia is staphylokinase, which is a first-generation thrombolytic derived from bacteria. It has no neutralizing anti-staphylokinase uh, antibodies. It is delivered as a single bolus of 10 mg IV, independent of the weight of the patient. Uh, there is some data from Russia that is more co cost-effective compared to alteplase. There is a phase three trial called FRIDA, which was conducted in, a, in Russia with a small sample size showing that it's non-inferior compared to alteplase, and it's the uh, approved thrombolytic agent for acute ischemic stroke in Russia. 
However, this requires further independent confirmation, and to the best of my knowledge, there are no ongoing phase three studies. A more attractive option is prorokinase, which is a second generation thrombolytic derived from urine. It has no binding with plasminogen activator inhibitor, so prorokinase is not inactivated. It has been approved for MI in China. It is given at a standard dose, independent of patient weight, of 35 milligram uh, IV. There is a bolus of 15 milligram, and the remaining 20 milligrams are given as an infusion over 30, not 60 minutes. It is shown that it's more cost effective compared to Alteplase in China. Uh, there are two uh, phase two RCTs with promising results in China. There is another phase three RCT coming out which is PROST. I reviewed this paper for Lancet and it was rejected. I'm sure that eventually it, was, it will be published in um, another medical journal, but uh, it shows some promising um, findings of uh, prorokinase. There is the PROUD phase 3 RCT beyond the 4.5 hour window in China, which is currently recruiting. And then there is a European trial called DUMAS. Now, uh, another important consideration is the extension of time window without advanced neuroimaging. We know that approximately one quarter of stroke patients uh, suffer a stroke on awakening and um, or during sleep, and approximately one quarter of patients who can be eligible for intravenous thrombolysis, unfortunately, do not receive this medication because they present outside the time window for intravenous thrombolysis. If we use advanced imaging criteria, either diffusion flare mismatch for wake up patients or CT perfusion imaging criteria, we may deny intravenous thrombolysis in some patients who might actually benefit. For instance, we know that diffusion flare mismatch can be absent in up to 40% of patients with no known stroke duration of less than three hours. We know that uh, CTP in the extended time window precludes lacking of stroke patients from receiving intravenous thrombolysis. And of course, the availability of uh, uh, MR and CT perfusion in a world uh, level and the world perspective is limited. And um, if we were able to uh, treat these patients based on non contrast CT and skip the advanced neuroimaging, this might shorten also the treatment time. However, for the time being, all international recommendations are against giving intravenous thrombolysis based on non contrast CT outside the window of 4.5 hours. However, there are promising observational data. I'm going to share with you a recent meta analysis that showed that uh, there is no increased risk of intracranial uh, hemorrhage in patients who are treated with intravenous thrombolysis using only non contrast CT and no evidence of early hypodensity on non contrast CT compared to patients who are treated within the 4.5 uh, hour window. What is also striking is the low rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage of 2% in these patients. Recently, a connected place was tested compared to placebo in patients with wake-up stroke who were selected based on non-contrast CT. This trial was called TWIST. It has recently appeared a couple of weeks ago, ago in Lancet Neurology and it was presented in May in the European Stroke Organization Conference. This was a very straightforward trial with simple inclusion and exclusion criteria. Unfortunately, there was no evidence of benefit with regard to the shift in the MRS score with the nectaplis compared to placebo. However, there were no safety concerns in terms of bleeding, either extracranially or intracranially. And in the per protocol analysis, there was a substantial trend uh, in favor of excellent functional outcome in patients treated with an ectoplase. So these are uh, promising results. So uh, if we want to conclude, I believe that intravenous thrombolysis appears to be safe in prospective open label studies, selecting wake up stroke patients based on non contrast CT. There is a one phase three RCT with promising findings that do not reach statistical significance. However,
sorry, Dr. Sevilla, I think you may be muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear now, thank you. Yeah. The last part of my lecture is intravenous thrombolysis before and after endovascular thrombectomy. Uh, there are theoretical arguments in favor and against pretreating these patients with intravenous uh, TPA. Uh, there is a strong observational data showing that in almost 12,000 LVO patients, 56 of which were treated with bridging therapy, there was improvement in different clinical outcomes without increasing the hemorrhage rate uh, when these patients received pretreatment with intravenous thrombolysis. This was a meta-analysis we published three years ago in Annals of Neurology. And especially with regard to the drip and sip scenario, this is a recent meta-analysis that came out a couple of days ago in uh, neurology where we showed that uh, uh, bridging therapy is superior compared to direct mechanical thrombectomy in terms of multiple clinical outcomes. Recently, the European Stroke Organization and the European Society for Minimally Invasive Neurological Therapy has issued an expedited recommendation with regard to uh, the use of bridging therapy versus direct mechanical thrombectomy in patients with large vessel occlusion. I was included in the co-author group and conducted many of the uh, analyses that I will present to you. First of all, in the drip and sip paradigm, where we have only non-randomized evidence, there is strong evidence favoring intravenous thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy compared to uh, mechanical thrombectomy alone in terms of uh, uh, good functional outcome. And uh, there is nearly statistical significance for the outcome of um, MRS 0 to 1. With regard to mortality, there is no increase uh, of mortality uh, when you use uh, bridging therapy. In contrast, uh, it appears to be in favor of bridging therapy compared to uh, mechanical thrombectomy alone. However, uh, the difference is not statistically significant. And this is a great table showing that in patients uh, uh, treated in the drip and sip paradigm, uh, bridging therapy is superior than direct mechanical thrombectomy. So the quality of evidence is low based on non-randomized data. However, there is a strong recommendation that uh, highlights that intravenous thrombolysis should be given in the primary so stroke center, followed by rapid transfer to the tertiary stroke center for the patient to receive mechanical thrombectomy. Then the second issue of this guideline was the EVT capable center and comparing bridging therapy to direct mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, when we performed the, this meta-analysis and uh, issued this recommendation, there were available uh, six randomized controlled trials. Uh, all of them had a non-inferiority design. In two of these trials, non-inferiority was proven. Both of these trials were conducted in China. However, in four out of six trials, non-inferiority was unproven, and these trials were conducted uh, either in Europe, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, some of them also in the uh, US. Now, I would like to highlight that the SKIP trial, use, which was conducted in Japan, used a low dose of 0.6 milligram per kilogram. As you can see, the non-inferiority thresholds were not crossed in direct MT and DEVT, showing that uh, these uh, two therapies uh, were non-inferior. However, they were crossed in SKIP, Mr. King, no IV, SWIFT direct and direct save, uh, showing uh, that uh, these two therapies were not equal, uh, disproving the non-inferiority hypothesis uh, in these four out of six trials. So uh, when we conducted our meta-analysis, we used a uh, two thresholds for non-inferiority, 1.3 and 5%. As you can see, both of these centers, thresholds were crossed by the lower confidence interval of uh, minus 5.85, showing that these two therapies were actually non-inferior. And uh, I would like to remind you that the non-inferiority margins for minimally clinically important difference that we used were based on a survey that, were, that was conducted by Jeff Savers group, uh, which uh, based on a stroke expert opinion, 1.3% and 5% difference were uh, enough to consider two therapies as non-inferior. What is interesting is that 
if we only evaluate the trials using a 0.9 milligram per kilogram dose of alteplase, you can see now that the lower confidence interval is even lower, 6.76. This crosses the threshold of enchanted trial that compared to doses of alteplase, 0.6 versus 0.9, and the non-inferiority threshold was 6.5%. And this is another analysis that we have conducted. It's unpublished. We have limited the trials that were conducted either in Europe, North America, and Australia. And there you can see a 5% absolute benefit increase in favor of uh, bridging therapy compared to direct mechanical thrombectomy. The difference is uh, nearly significant. The p-value is 0 0.07. And again, the number needed to treat is 20 based on this analysis. Now, with regard to successful reperfusion, bridging therapy increased the odds of successful reperfusion compared to direct mechanical thrombectomy. There was no difference with regard to all cause or mortality or symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. However, uh, direct mechanical thrombectomy reduced the odds of any intracranial hemorrhage, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, compared to bridging therapy. Based on this analysis, there was moderate quality of evidence and a strong recommendation that patients directly admitted to thrombectomy capable center who are eligible for both treatments should receive combination of intravenous thrombolysis plus mechanical thrombectomy. And uh, both treatments should be performed simultaneously as early after hospital arrival. If we would like to summarize the available data with regard to pretreating LVO patients with intravenous thrombolysis and make some conclusions. I would like to highlight that the absolute benefit of alteplase with regard to excellent functional outcome, MR0 to 1, in the previous RCTs comparing alteplase to placebo was 10% and 5% in the window of three to four and a half hours. So when most of these trials used uh, a non-inferiority margin for functional outcome ranging from 8 to 12%, these were very generous and approximately 100 or 200% of the potential effect size. Uh, so you see that when we use uh, more clinically relevant non-inferiority margins, like 5%, which for me it's, uh, it is something uh, very practical, then there is clear evidence that uh, bridging therapy should be used over direct mechanical thrombectomy. If we would like to summarize the available randomized controlled trials, bridging therapy results in a non-significant increase in SICH, approximately 2% absolute increase, a non-significant decrease of 1% in mortality, a non-significant increase of 2% in functional independence, and a significant increase in the final reperfusion rate of 4%, leading to averting thrombectomies in this patient population. Now, uh, there are also some theoretical concerns for bridging therapy in the context of recent RCTs uh, that we should uh, keep in mind. First of all, uh, the two trials in favor of direct mechanical thrombectomy were conducted in China where there is no reimbursement for alteplase. So the patients had to pay it out, out of their pocket for the alteplase. So this introduces a potential selection bias. Tenecteplase may further enhance the efficacy of pretreatment with intravenous thrombolysis, and we are awaiting the results of multiple phase three trials. The drip and sip approach is more common than the mother sip approach, and there is very solid observational day, uh, evidence in favor of using intravenous thrombolysis followed by mechanical thrombectomy in the drip and sip scenario. And of course, mobile stroke units shorten onset to treatment time and substantially increase the efficacy of intravenous thrombolysis and the rates of avert thrombectomy. So this is another argument in favor of bridging therapy. Uh, recently, uh, a lot of uh, discussion uh, was conducted with regard to the no reflow phenomenon, which may contribute to futile recanalization in a substantial proportion, up to 40% of large vessel occlusion patients who have successful reperfusion following mechanical thrombectomy without clinical improvement. Intraarterial thrombolysis may target thrombosis in distal arteries in the microcirculation, increase the rate of TK3 over TK2B reperfusion, and of course, prevent reocclusion in the microcirculation. 
there is uh, a solid observational data highlighting the potential efficacy of intraarterial thrombolysis post endovascular thrombectomy. And in this meta analysis, there was a 22% increase in the odds of good functional outcome defined as MRS0 to 2 with intraarterial thrombolysis. Recently, the results of CHOICE trial, which was conducted in Catalonia, Spain, uh, uh, were published. And in this trial, intraarterial TPA infusion at a dose of 0 0.2 to 5 milligram per kilogram, distal to the uh, lenticulostriate arteries, was compared to placebo infusion in patients with large vessel occlusion who were treated successfully with mechanical thrombectomy. This trial was positive with regard to the primary endpoint, which was excellent functional outcome, MRS 0 to 1, and the absolute benefit increase was 19%. There was no increase in bleeding or serious adverse events, and currently there are four ongoing trials testing this approach of intraarterial thrombolysis, now with the nectoplase, following successful endovascular thrombectomy. So uh, this is my concluding slide. Uh, we see that in the past years, we have expanded the indications of intravenous thrombolysis for acute ischemic stroke in patients with non-disabling stroke and large vessel occlusion, in patients that are predicted with NOAX, and in patients with previous recent uh, ischemic stroke more than 14 days uh, following the index stroke. TNK at a dose of 0 0.25 milligram per kilogram appears a very attractive option, which is non-inferior to alteplase for unselected acute ischemic stroke patients and superior to alteplase in large vessel occlusion patients. Uh, we have uh, observational data that we can treat outside the 4.5 window uh, acute ischemic stroke patients with um, non-contrast CT and no evidence of early hypodensity with intravenous thrombolysis. However, this is off-label, and we need more randomized trial, uh, data. Uh, I believe that pretreatment with intravenous thrombolysis before mechanical thrombectomy for large vessel occlusion patients remains the gold standard, both in the DRIP and SIP scenario and the mother SIP scenario. Uh, intraarterial thrombolysis with TPA is a new frontier, a very attractive new frontier that can improve no reflow phenomenon by targeting distal thrombosis in the microcirculation and prevent reocclusion in the macrocirculation. And of course, we can expand the indication of our therapeutic options with intravenous thrombolysis using uh, thrombolytics of label in everyday clinical practice. And uh, we should also follow an individualized approach. However, we should randomize our patients in multiple ongoing RCTs. And of course, uh, I believe that individual patient data meta-analysis of completed RCTs will provide us with definitive answers to our questions. So I think that uh, since 1995, over the past um, almost 30 years, it has been a wonderful journey seeing the expansion of indications of intravenous thrombolysis, uh, experiencing a potentially novel thrombolytic agent for acute ischemic stroke, which is the nectoplase, and also experiencing the potential benefit of intravenous thrombolysis in large vessel occlusion patients, both before and after mechanical thrombectomy. I'm sure that in a couple of years, these frontiers will have moved, they would further expand it. And I believe more important than reaching the frontier is the whole journey and the experience of uh, using thrombolytic agents in acute ischemic stroke settings. Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I have a, just a quick question in the, the post thrombectomy, um, TPA, did the patients also get it prior to the thrombectomy? Yes, yes. So they got it, it was a sandwich, yes, TPA yes. sandwich. So this was a, a very pragmatic clinical tra trial. If the patient had the contraindication for intravenous thrombolysis before thrombectomy, they were treated with direct mechanical thrombectomy. If they had no contraindication for systemic thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy, they received both therapies. However, it is interesting to say that pretreatment with intravenous thrombolysis was not associated with increased risk of intracranial bleeding, even in patients who received intravenous thrombolysis, mechanical thrombectomy, and intraarterial thrombolysis. 
Okay, th uh, thank you. Uh, anyone with a question, just put your name or your question in the chat. I'll just throw it to Brian, who I'm sure has a question or a comment. Yeah, certainly. Thanks so much, Dr. Sabulis, for that wonderful talk. Um, I have a question about bridging thrombolysis. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> when the trials have been conducted, um, they've used a rather, you know, the definition of large vessel occlusion, which includes internal carotid artery occlusion, M1, M2, and proximal M2 occlusion. And to me, that seems like a rather heterogeneous group. You know, we know that um, TPA is very, very good for like a, a proximal M2 occlusion and not so good for a proximal ICA occlusion. And for thrombectomy, it's vice versa. It's a phenomenal therapy for an ICA or proximal M1 occlusion, but not so good for sort of more distal occlusions. And it seems to me that there's quite a lot of heter heterogeneity. So like when you were making the decision in clinical practice about whether to use a bridging thrombolytic agent, would the actual size or the location of the vessel change your thinking in any way? Um, actually, I, I, I greatly disagree with the, the notion that uh, TPA is harmful in patients with ICA occlusion. Okay, There is no solid data behind it. There is only observational data. This data is generated by uh, interventional neurologists who are more invested in mechanical thrombectomy than systemic thrombolysis. What the solid data shows, and this is based on the individual patient data meta-analysis that was recently presented in the World Stroke Con Congress by Urs Fischer that combined the data of these six trials, is that uh, there is no interaction between location of occlusion and efficacy of pretreatment of in, uh, uh, intravenous thrombolysis uh, in patients with large vessel occlusion. So I would not differentiate my treatment based on the location of occlusion, especially with regard to pretreatment with intravenous thrombolysis. Um, okay, so I'll ask one last question. I don't see any others. So. Let's say you have a, a hub and spoke model of a telestroke network, and uh, uh, you know everyone gets TPA who should be getting it in in the uh, spoke hospitals. What percent of thrombectomies should you expect to be doing to the patients who are shipped back to the mothership? Ten percent. Only ten percent. Yes, one out of ten. But at a global level, this is huge number. But it also fills up your hub hospital with a bunch of people you didn't really help. These patients will receive mechanical thrombectomy. So they're no, not no, that's what I'm, what I'm saying. What percent of the ones that get <coughs> transferred in would you do a thrombectomy on? Did you mean uh, 90%? I, excuse me. Yeah. I, I, I replied with 10%. Uh, because uh, those who will be transferred, a 10% of thrombectomies will be averted based on intravenous thrombolysis. Okay, so you're saying you should expect to do 90% of thrombectomies on those you no, transfer No, I'm in. saying that 10% of these patients will not need any thrombectomy. Right. Now, with regard to the remaining 90% who, who will have a persisting occlusion when they reach the comprehensive stroke center, uh, approximately... Uh, one third will be outside the time window for mechanical thrombectomy, or they will not feel, fulfill the advanced neuroimaging criteria to receive uh, mechanical thrombectomy. However, this might this percentage might change following the result of Select Two trial, which was positive, and this was a trial who uh, compared the mechanical thrombectomy versus standard meat treatment in, pages, in patients with large core infarction. So these patients were not included in the previous randomized control trial. So I believe that this percentage, having the new clinical trials, which are positive, all the new clinical trials of thrombectomy actually are very <coughs> positive, even for large core infarction, will reduce, will be reduced, will shrink over time. So about 50%, you think, right now? Yep. Okay. So, Richie, it is about a 50% got to treat on the, on the Duke Taylor stroke. I think that's one of the frontier is actually how to increase uh, 
thrombectomy. So neural protection probably is some way we should do because at this moment all the patients be transferred to the mothership without, with you know, the brains without being protected. Uh, I think if we can find a way to protect those brains, I think uh, theoretically we can increase of a thromb uh, thrombectomy once those patients reach the reach the mothership. Right, so. but it's it's such a problem for a big hospital to ship in a bunch of patients who don't wind up with a thrombectomy and now, then wind up filling hospital beds for several weeks, which means you deny the service to other potential patients. I completely agree, yeah, yeah. Well, I have a question for Georgius, and thanks for your very good talk, um, very comprehensive. One area, you know, is those patients, you know, presents in more than four and a half hours, but don't have LVO, or you just don't have visible, you know, vessel occlusion. What do you think, uh, you know, we th there's a large proportion of those patients, you know, we basically just put antiparates, put on the service. Is there anything we can do on those patients? Yeah, based on the results of extend trial, uh, uh, CD perfusion or MR perfusion can help us select these patients for giving intravenous thrombolysis in the extended time window. With regard to wake up stroke patients, uh, we can use the uh, diffusion flare mismatch also to give thrombolysis uh, in this uh, specific patient subgroup. And also, there are additional trials using the nectoplase. And based on non contra CT, actually, there are four of them that may give us the opportunity, based on non contra CT, to offer thrombolysis with the nectoplase in this patient. So, this is another new frontier. You might need to invite me after three years to give a totally different lecture. So, I think this is moving, you know, this is not static, this is very dynamic. There are multiple clinical trials. I think the direction is to treat as many possible, as many patients as possible, either with intravenous thrombolysis or thrombectomy, or both. Thank you. All right, uh, Brian, thank you for arranging, and Georgios, thank you very much for an absolutely amazing talk. So much data, my head spinning. Uh, but uh, what time is it in Greece? Uh, it's uh, four p.m. It's a good time for me. <laughs> it's too early for you. Yeah. All right. Well, have a great day. Everyone else Thank have you. a great day and see you next week.